Good morning. The May 6th Board of Education meeting is now in session. Please rise for the invocation. Oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance. Stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. A Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item... 2.03 approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? All those in favor? Motion passes 500. Zero, zero. I should mention that Ms. Chaudhry is currently taking an AP exam, um, but will join us later if she can. And Mr. Webb is on travel today. Item 2.04 establish agenda order, and the agenda stands as published. Item 2.05, recognitions. We do not have any recognitions today. Item 2.06, Educator of the Month, Mrs. Birch. Thank you very much. A functional life skills program focuses on everyday skills for special education students, personal social skills, hygiene, and independent life skills such as cooking and clothing care and work competencies. These skills are essential for special education students to learn because they provide the basis for independence and they facilitate transition into the real world. Learning life skills are best done by doing. Enter our Educator of the Month for May, a special education teacher who facilitates this entire process of learning by doing. Mary Ann Manning, special educator and lead teacher in the Functional Life Skills Program at North County High School, coordinates and schedules the FLS program, which is no easy task. Not only is it a large program, it is extremely diverse due to the wide range of disabilities among students. Marianne is a leader. Her colleagues on the FLS team rely on her input when decisions need to be made about particular students. She is very organized, organized about her teaching, organized about the scheduling of students, and organized about the scheduling of teaching assistants to be on duty when students need the services that her program provides. Miss Manning is a real team player. She is consistently involved in programs throughout the school that supports the students, staff, and the community, such as the Thanksgiving share, school custodial parties, and fundraisers. As the unified sports coach at North County, she puts forth amazing recruiting efforts and is very successful at it, going the whole nine yards to accomplish her goal. She's most known for recruiting two busloads of students and staff with very little notice to participate in the polar bear plunge after she learned that North County was the only high school not represented in this annual chilly day on the bay. Marianne Manning, you are a leader, a team player, and a dedicated professional. You facilitate the goal of special education to gain as much independence and autonomy as possible, whether your student's disability is emotional, intellectual, physical, or a combination of two or more. Self-determination is what you teach in your functional life skills program, and you are a most valued educator in our school system. So on behalf of the Board of Education and the entire special education and North County high school communities, we are honored to recognize you as Educator of the Month for May 2015. Congratulations and please join me up front. Ms. Harris uh -huh. and my department chair, Ms. Piet, 
and, uh, and my, um, some people surprised you. My didn't daughter, you? my daughter, uh -huh. and um, my boyfriend, uh -huh. and my friend Kelly. You had no idea. I had and no idea. All Zero. Knew. They all knew, and I kept saying, "I wonder what it's about." And, I'm a good secret keeper. Yeah. Well, congratulations, and thank you so much for thank everything you, you do you, for you, our thank students. You. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs>We'll have all of you stay, stay by uh, for pictures after our break. Uh, employee, employee of the month, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, ma'am. Today's high school students are living in, a, in an exciting time with an increasingly diverse society, um, new technologies and expanding opportunities. To help ensure that they are prepared to become the next worker, workers and leaders in our society, every student needs support and guidance that helps them face challenges in life that will have a direct impact on academic achievement. The high school guidance counselor is a professional educator with a mental health perspective who understands and responds to the, to the life challenges students face today. Secondary school counselors do not work in isolation. Rather, they are an integral part of the total education, educational program. Take Annapolis High, for example, a large high school with a diverse population and guidance counselors who have challenging jobs jobs that are performed more efficiently and thoroughly with the support of our employee of the month for May, Carol Delaney. <laughs> Ms. Delaney plays a huge role in the daily operation of the counseling office. She is willing to perform any tasks needed to support the school counselors, whether it is data collection, scheduling, individual student planning, or crisis intervention. She takes her counseling duties outside the walls of the counseling office in support of her avid interest in student athletics, working closely with coaches to ensure the students are su succeeding academically and meeting the required grade point average. Carol Delaney is the face of the counseling office. When there, are, when there were changes in the office recently, she was the steady force behind the counselor's work, make, making the transition a stress-free one. She goes out of her way to make sure that everyone's needs in the office are met. She handles all challenges with decorum, never showing any signs of annoyance or anger. Her work is above and beyond the call of duty at all times, and she works hard to make the guidance counselor's job a smooth one. The mission of Annapolis High School, an, an exceptionally diverse school community, is to advance academic achievement and unity among our students through mutual respect trust and excellence in both teaching and learning. School counselors align their work with the school's mission through the implementation of a successful school counseling program and you, Carol, are the heart of this mission. So for these reasons and many more, the Board of Education is honored to recognize you Employee of the Month for May 2015. Congratulations, please come forward. Several folks came out. They did. Who all are they? Um, well, I have my whole department, I think, here. Um, <laughs> there's lots of people I know. My husband's here. Uh, <laughs> gee, PE's here. <laughs> so, well, congratulations yes. to oh, you. We have this wonderful thank nice bill. Thank you so much. certificate signed by our president. Oh, I appreciate public. that. And my wife absolutely oh, thank you. Well, thank you guys for letting me work at Annapolis High. Item 2.08, Volunteer of the Month, Mrs. Nelly. <clears throat> Many of our wonderful Anne Arundel County School volunteers contribute their time and talent on a regular basis. Today, the Board of Education is proud to honor one whose school volunteering has truly been her vocation at Broadneck Elementary School since 2004, Nicole Roberts. Who's Miss Nicole? 
she here? Right here. Uh, <laughs> with endless energy and consistent professionalism, Nicole has served on just about every possible volunteer committee at Broadneck Elementary as possible. Oh my From hospitality to book fair to holiday shop year after year. During most of her 12 years at Broadneck, she served on the PTA PTO board. She was an inspiring president for two years. Then, when no one else stepped forward, Nicole decided to do it again for another two years. If someone has a question about PTO protocol, Nicole is quick to answer and always offers support. With unparalleled competence, Nicole brought high standards to the volunteer program as the volunteer coordinator for three years. She led the volunteer orientation program for well over 2,000 people during her tenure and developed an efficient method of pairing volunteers with appropriate committees. With her years of experience and attention to detail, it's naturally Nicole who coordinates volunteer schedules for yearly school events such as flu mist days, vision and hearing screenings, or picture days. This school year, in addition to her PTO president duties, Nicole Roberts oversaw the launching of a new PTO website and initiated two new Broadneck Elementary School events. First, the Hero Boys Run Club and the Race for Education, a seven-week program in which third, fourth, and fifth grade boys were mentored by positive male role models to set goals, include participation in the culminating 5K race last November. The new fundraiser, Race for Education, was a running walking event for students and staff that brought in over $4,000 to the Broadneck PTO. With Nicole's golden touch, both successful events will remain on the BES event calendar for years to come. Nicole even serves as a classroom substitute. She's beloved by each of Broadneck's 730 students whom she knows by name. Volunteer coordinator Jen Dunn writes, Nicole is an amazing gift to the Broadneck Elementary School and Arnold community. As she moves with her youngest to middle school, Nicole lives a la leaves a lasting legacy of a dynamic PTO and volunteer program. Thank you, Nicole Roberts. Would you please come forward? With great appreciation, I would like to present this Volunteer of the Month certificate and bell to you. to talk about the race for education which earned $44,000. Oh wow. Oh, wow. I have to correct. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> well, I want to thank you very much. Here thank is a certificate you. and a nice bell. Oh, thank and you. who do you Boys. have with you today? Um, I have my children and I hope my oldest missed a math a pre-calc test today, so I hope he'll be able to make that up. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure he will. <laughs> but I'm sure he's very Dr. excited. Dr. Arlotta, you make sure you make that up. <laughs> he did get on the bus this morning. I hope, I'm sure he's very happy. I'll have to talk to his teacher about that. So I have my three children, my husband and my father, who was a educator in Howard County for 30 years, and my two other PTO presidents from Broadnick Elementary, and the current PTO president of Broadneck Elementary and the VP of Broadneck Elementary, PTO of the PTO, and our pre principal, and my dear friend and the guidance counselor of Broadneck Elementary, Kim uh, Bicar, and our uh, outgoing uh, secretary and hopefully future board member, Kia Chandler. So, uh, oh, I don't know, how can you not be? You're well represented. I, great. Uh -huh. Wonderful uh -huh. people. Wonderful well, people. Thank you so thank much you. for all that you do. I was an AP at Broadneck for two years, so oh. I know this school well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> Item 2.09, School and Community Highlights. Mrs. Ritchie. I hope this it makes you as happy as it made my granddaughter the other night wearing this. I'm going to wear it just for a moment. Um, you'll notice I have a red nose. Uh, and this is to raise awareness for childhood poverty. It's an initiative that's being done through NBC. And I'm going to take it and just put it here because make it easier to understand. Um, it's an initiative that's being run it's through the Comic Relief. But I thought it was apropos to wear today because one of the major ways that we can 
um, alleviate and, and address childhood poverty is through education. And right now we're in the middle of the great give. And so I would like to encourage those who maybe haven't had the opportunity yet to, to uh, continue to give to the great give. We can, um, all the money that will be raised will go to one of the five initiatives that we're going to that we support and that's technology early literacy after school and summer opportunities college and career readiness and community and family outreach i want to make sure people understand this is in addition this is to augment to to enhance it's not to replace it won't buy us a teacher it won't do things like that what this will do is help to um, augment these opportunities and provide opportunities for those kids those living in poverty and those living not within poverty so uh, it goes until six o'clock tonight. It's it's put on by the community, the Anne Arundel Community Foundation, and it's um, an online fundraiser. In case you haven't seen the multitude of tweets and Facebook postings that have come out from your schools, uh, when you go on there, make sure that you indicate that your school did that you heard it from your school, because then that helps to. Um, there's they're doing some kind of contest and stuff like that, so that helps to that. The uh, while we want to raise as much money as possible for our children, our goal in the event is to have the most donors because this gets us a ten thousand dollar prize from the community foundation and from Greenberg Gibbons. So if we can take a look at the leaderboard, this is live. Ooh, is this exciting? Uh, unfortunately, we are number three. We have two hundred and nine total um, donors right now. So we want to try to get that higher because we need to go above four hundred actually. We have over 80,000 students and 12,000 employees. The lowest you can do is $15. It is all online. You can, you know, that's what you can give. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to ask people to, to ask their friends, and they don't have to live in Anne Arundel County. It's all online, remember. So they can just go to the Great Give site, go to our website, click on the little apple there, and it'll take you right straight to it. It's very easy to do, um, and, and I hope that you'll take the opportunity to do that. So. Uh, in, in honor of childhood poverty, one more time, just to, if my granddaughter's watching, she just thought that was thrilling last night, and I'd like to, to talk that. And I, and one other thing I'd like to do is, is also, during this time, I talk about, this is the month that we seem to recognize everybody and everything, and um, and this month is especially important because it is Teacher Appreciation Month uh, week, and, and we want to take the opportunity to... I would personally like to thank all those who have chosen to become teachers and to work in our school system. We, we truly do appreciate all that you do for all of our students, and we thank you very much. Mrs. Birch. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say it's also Nurses Appreciation Week, so thank you, Debbie, oh, yeah. for being a nurse. <laughs> Um, the next thing I'd like to say is that on um, Friday evening I had the opportunity to go to Arundel High School where they dedicated their baseball field to Coach Bernie Walter. Um, I want to say John Noon was there because he was an Arundel baseball player, so go John. Um, Bernie spent 36 years as, at, as the head coach at Arundel High School. He won 10 state championships, 15 regional titles. He had a career record of 609 to 185, which was a .767 winning record, which is pretty amazing. Um, in 2007, he was inducted into the American Baseball Coaches Association Hall of Fame, which is usually reserved for college coaches. Um, he was only the third person from Maryland to ever be inducted into that Hall of Fame. And also in 2007, he was inducted into the inaugural class of the National High School Coaches Association Hall of Fame. So um, congratulations to Bernie Walter. Um, the field had a beautiful sign with his name on it, and it was a great event. So just wanted to let everybody know about that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that, um, in case you didn't notice, there's only five of us up here, and that's a real problem. I hope none of us have to go to the bathroom when it's time to have a vote, because we won't be able to vote. I think that's a real problem. Um, we only have seven members right now. It's been um, almost four months since the governor came into office. He has had um, names for two vacancies for nearly that entire time. I think he got the names in February for our two vacancies. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned, and I just wanted to share that with the public. I'm, I'm not concerned about who the people are. I'm concerned that there are people. I think our children deserve to have a full board of education that can carry out its business. And I think that we're doing a disservice 
to the children, to the people of this county to not have a full board of education. We have one person who's traveling on business and our student member is taking an AP exam. My daughter's been sick. If she had been sick today, I couldn't have stayed home with her or we couldn't have had a meeting. We would have had to cancel our meeting. That's a problem. The governor has a responsibility in the law to appoint our board members. There isn't a time frame given, but there's a responsibility in the law. If you're as concerned as I am, please go to his website and let him know that you're concerned and that you think that Anne Arundel County's children deserve a fully seated board of education and please ask for him to act as quickly as possible. Thank you. Mrs. Nelly. <clears throat> Last week, um, I attended the Scholarship for Scholars uh, event, and which awards scholarships to many of our county high school seniors who um, earn the scholarships based on academic uh, achievement. Many organizations provide additional scholarships, uh, and I won't name all of them, but I would do want to point out the retired teachers uh, because it is Teacher Appreciation Week, and so I'm going to appreciate retired teachers. I'm one of those, too. <laughs> but um, this organization each year provides three $4,000 each, so that's $12,000 worth of scholarships to three Anne Arundel County students who profess an interest in go and are going on to become teachers. And I think that's a great give. I really do, and, uh, and it's been going on for many years. So my personal thanks, I'm a member of the group too, but I have to you know, say that. But I do wanna thank the group for, for making such a huge commitment to uh, the educating uh, of teachers, especially of our own students who might like to become teachers and may not be able to, to pursue that. $4,000 is a, is a substantial amount of money uh, for these young students. So thank you so much. Also, uh, yesterday, I attended with Debbie Ritchie and Dr. Arlotto, Overlook Elementary School. We went to the kindergartens, and uh, they, two of them, and they re we read some of, they were all published authors, and we read some of their publications. The students were absolutely wonderful. It was just the highlight of, of this week. Not, not that the board meeting isn't, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but it was really fun to go to that, um, school and see those students light up when Dr. Orlato and and Debbie Ritchie and I were reading their own published works. Uh, it was quite a joy. It's a wonderful school. So thank you very much. Debbie, did you wear your red nose yesterday too? No, I didn't. Okay. I asked one of the kindergarten teachers if I could and she told me no. Okay. Oh, it was your daughter. That would be my daughter. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Orlato. Thank you. Um, uh, I do want to um, echo uh, the time we had at Overlook yesterday. It was really fabulous. It was a great way uh, for us to spend some time with the kids. Uh, they were delighted, and it was um, they have focused, their school has focused on writing and a way of improving literacy through writing, and it is across all grade levels, beginning with kindergarten um, uh, right up through um, uh, the fifth grade, and so it was a, a, a really fun time. Uh, likewise, after I left Overlook, I then went to Marley Middle School, and I spent two hours touring classrooms um, and, and watching instruction with one of their fabulous assistant principals, Jim Wisman, and uh, we would debrief after we, after we left each classroom. And as I went through, <clears throat> um, I, I asked, as I do as I visit schools, what is your focus for the school? And your school improvement plan, where do you really want the school to go? And he said they're spending a lot of their time in professional development and focusing on, on literacy and in particular building vocabulary for their students. And I assure you that in each one of the classrooms, and I think I visited 12, including an AVID classroom, uh, the focus was, was really set on building vocabulary in lots of different ways, shapes, and forms. And so it was very dynamic lessons, uh, and that was a good day spent at Marley Middle School. I was really proud of the work they're doing there. Last night, I got the opportunity to attend the Washington Post um, Awards Dinner uh, and program for the Principals of the Year in the Washington metro area. Our very own Sandy Blondell, the principal at uh, Park Elementary School, was our awardee. It was a fabulous evening. Many of us were there to uh, her family and friends. Um, Ms. Gilbert and Ms. Herbert and Mr. Liverman were all there present as well, and it was uh, an exciting evening to honor Sandy Blondell and the great work she's done at Park Elementary School. Thank you. 
And I just had a couple of um, updates. I had an opportunity on Friday to go to our county executive's budget presentation, which you all will hear about shortly. And on Monday, I went to my first Annapolis Education Commission meeting, and it was just really wonderful to spend uh, an hour and a half with the folks from the Annapolis area, the community members and the, the school administrators, learning about some of the issues going on and sharing what we have going on in the Annapolis area as well. And lastly, I would like to echo what Debbie and Teresa said and just thank everyone who has chosen to serve AACPS as either a teacher or a nurse. We really appreciate you. Item 2.10 is the CAC report. Do we have anyone from CAC here today? No. Okay. Then it is time to take a break to take some pictures of the Educator Employee Volunteer of the Month, and we'll come back for public comment.
The next portion of our meeting is the public comment portion. Anyone wishing to speak on an item not on today's agenda may offer testimony during this public comment portion of the meeting. Speakers will be allotted three minutes each. The board asks that comments remain civil and appropriate for the various audiences that may be watching or viewing this meeting. Student-specific and personnel matters are confidential and cannot be discussed in this forum. The time is intended for speakers to voice their opinion and not necessarily as a question and answer period. Speakers may pose questions, but answers will be counted toward the three-minute allotment. For the record, please give your name before speaking and handouts should be given to the board assistant. I don't have any completed cards today. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the board at this time? Okay. Hi, my, my name is Lisa Miller. I um, live in Edgewater. Um, do I need to, any other information for me? <laughs> Uh, my question is that how is it possible that despite the county executive having gone on record in the Capitol that later school start times was one of his top priorities and the Board of Education and the County Council both asked for funding in the transportation budget for bus routing software that the funding is still not there? Okay. So, okay. So. We have the same question. Okay. So, okay. So is the bus routing software is ready to be purchased or no the there's an RFP on the street but the county executive did not include it in his budget okay okay thank you Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Okay, we'll move on to action items. Item 4.01, administrative personnel appointments. Dr. Orlato, your recommendation, please. Yes, ma'am. I recommend the personnel listed on the attached sheet be promoted and or appointed. All those in favor? Motion passes, five zero zero. Action item 4.02, personnel. Dr. Orlato, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I recommend the board approve the actions as stipulated on the attached sheets. Second. All those in favor? Motion passes, 500. Action item 4.03, the 2015-16 school year calendar revision. And we uh, have a presentation. Dr. Leto, your recommendation? I recommend approval of, of the revised 2015-2016 school year calendar as attached. Second. We'll have the presentation first and then I'll take questions. Good morning. I'm Teresa Tudor and I'm here today as the chair of the calendar committee. We are proposing several changes to the approved 1516 calendar. The first is moving the 2016 presidential primary election from Tuesday, April 5th to Tuesday, April 26th. This change was needed because of the new legislation the General Assembly passed. Second, with regard to the inclement weather, the attached draft of the calendar continues to build in five days for inclement weather, and we would use, we would, they would be used to make up the first five days if we did have closings. Any of the other days that are not needed for inclement weather closings would be subtracted from the calendar if we don't need all five. Should more than five days be needed, the superintendent will discuss a potential waiver with the Maryland State Department of Education, making a decision on using specific days during Easter spring break as makeup days. Easter Monday, which while it must go before the Maryland State Department of Education's board ha has never been denied if anyone has chosen to use that as one of the makeup days. And many, many counties have done this in the last several years. So there are some other options that we could discuss so that the wording has changed on that piece as well. Good morning, for the record, Bob Moser, Chief Communications Officer. Uh, the other piece that is changing, we're proposing to change in the calendar before you is more substantive for parents, uh, it builds in uh, the superintendent is looking to move to a place where we have parent-teacher conferences in all four marking periods. This would be the first step in that it would build in a parent-teacher conference day at all schools on Monday, February 22nd. 
Um, so schools would be closed for students and we'd have parent-teacher conferences. To accommodate that, uh, we would move the end of the school year one day to Friday, June 17th, and then to accommodate the language in uh, some of our negotiated agreements, the first day of the two-day semester break, which is normally a professional development day for teachers, teachers would be off. So that would bring them back into alignment in their calendar year. Then we would continue to have discussions about moving in future calendars to one in each of the one parent-teacher conference in each of the four marking periods. The November parent-teacher conferences, as they have traditionally been held, would stand for next school year. Mrs. Birch. Um, two questions for clarification. So those um, parent-teacher conferences then would be for all students now, not just the lower grades. Correct. Right. So high schools would be included. Correct. Okay. And the second question, um, which the so then the day off the the there are currently two days off for students um, in January and this coming calendar the 2015-16 school year one day off for teachers we wouldn't continue to do that in future years where there were two days off for students and one day off for teachers would we we would we we'd would have to look at we would probably right, we would build, build the calendar right. differently but given right. the, the time constraints with this okay this was the, so that's the best way okay so it. that's not going to be a right. an ongoing thing right. okay those were my two questions thank you mrs ritchie uh, just something that was just brought up uh, having to do with the high school exams and I, I, I don't know how this all works, so just you know, bear with me just for a minute. So at the end of the four, after the, hand, the, last, the last day for teachers is the day that they're doing all the grading and putting all the grades and doing all that kind of things. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Currently now, it's it a stands, work day. It's a work day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the students aren't in the building. Right. Okay. They also so, have the afternoons as the work time too. To okay. But I mean, but traditionally we have done that where we've, provided that day for them to to kind of like finish up that right. that semester and then get ready for the next semester yes and so if we take the January day into February that that that's in that semester so at, at semester break there's traditionally one professional development day and one teacher work day we're not eliminating the teacher work day okay just the professional development Correct. day Okay, so they still have the teacher work day so, so that they can prepare their classes and, and change their stuff and, and do all that. So they would have four days, four consecutive days of two hour early dismissals, which are the exam days. Right. Followed by a three day weekend, followed by a work day. <laughs> and is that work day the day that they were having the, the conferences? No. Okay. No, no. So the that's conferences are no. a separate okay. time. No. Well, and, and that's, that's. The work day would be in January, to... the conferences would be in February. Oh, okay. Okay. So they still have that, that, that day, it's just it's moved from where, yes. instead of it following at the end of the four days, they'd have the four days, then we have a three day weekend, and then the, the, the day the they come back. Because as we looked at the calendar, as it falls this year, we didn't want them to have two day weekend, bring them back for a work day on Monday, and have off on Tuesday, and then start classes on Wednesday. Okay, so that works, that, that works this year. For, Correct. For, okay, so they still have the work day, but it's just changed where it is. All right, thank you. Yeah, I had a similar question. The, that Monday of January's professional development is typically um, the Monday after exams is typically professional development where they're all they're not in their classrooms switching well, I think one of those days is professional development right? one of those two days so they really only they've only really ever had one day to be in their classroom to switch their classes over Correct. okay and then um, I know that the original calendar that was printed said November 23rd to 24th the schools closed for students and teachers that's been that was really meant to just say schools schools are closed for students correct because there'll still be parent and teacher conferences. Correct. right and did this go before the calendar committee go back to them what well, we af when the changes were made before we came here we sent it to the calendar committee we did not bring them in again we sent it out and asked for any input and the only input we got were changing things like the teachers on the 23rd 24th more um housekeeping on the actual <laughs> calendar so they were okay with the the days we didn't ask for a specific February. vote but we got no negative feedback okay. I don't have any other board questions or comments uh, how about any public comments good morning uh, Richard Benford president of the Teachers Association of Anne Arundel County. Um, 
the calendar in 2015-16 that we're in right now says uh, the two days schools are closed for students, professional development work day for elementary and middle school. So what is happening is I have a concern about the high school educators losing a work day in January that is needed in order to turn over for the new semester. During the four half days, educators are busy grading exams. On the first work day, educators are finalizing grading and inputting grades and preparing report cards and paperwork, especially IEP paperwork that goes with all of that. The second work day is used to turn over rosters and prepare for a new semester and prepare classes for the next day when students come. Um, so I know high school teachers will have a, a, a difficult time with this change and I strongly recommend that you do not do this. The alternate days are available in the calendar. MSEA day is an alternate day. Also, students go 181 days in Anne Arundel County that is not required by the state. So you have a, a 181st student day that could be used for this purpose, um, which is a great idea, but I don't think it should be done this way. Thanks. Mrs. Birch. I have a question for Mr. Benfer. The reason we added that 181st day was so that we could get teachers to go to high school graduations. Mm -hmm. There's really no other way to get them to go unless it's a work day. Do you have another alternative yep. to yep. convince them to go to their students' high school graduations if, unless it's a requirement because it's a work day? Well, if you have your graduations during the student day when teachers are there, then you would have teachers attending graduation. Right, but that's why we had to add an extra school day so that high schools were still in session for 180 days and we could cancel the 181st day in high schools. So you have school going on for ninth, 10th, and 11th grade, and teachers that teach the seniors, they can go and monitor, and maybe some of the ancillary people that are not in the schools all the time could come and help with that too. But most teachers teach all grades. There aren't very many teachers who just teach okay. one That's grade. a logistic so, that you'd have to figure right, out. Well, and that's why right. we had to go to 181 right. days was so that we could close the school so that the teachers would come because but honestly really you went to 181 days because one school's parent behavior and so forth was bad so let's be uh, honest and you uh, really don't need that day I, I i think i think we do so mrs ritchie and then the other problem is is unfortunately the msea day is in the first semester and we need it for the second semester and and i know that there have been parents who have been calling for for um they want to have a second back to school night and not granted i i'm fully aware having gone to back to school nights that elementary you can't get in the door and and in, in high school you basically are like the lone parent walking down the hallway and and i fully understand that but the the point is is that if we start we need to start changing the culture and the people had wanted a second time for them to meet their second semester teachers because they didn't have that opportunity and and you know so the first back to school night you could go and meet your back your teachers but in the second semester your know, second marking period i mean the second semester you couldn't meet your teachers unless you you know made a special appointment to do that so i think there has to be a little give and take on both sides and and my concern was that i thought they were losing a day but actually the day is being moved to another day so they still have that one day and they have a two-hour early dismissal so so they have no i didn't miss the point they they still have four hours they have two hours after school each day because the students are out so that's that's there and plus they have that extra day and then the other question is are there there are other counties that don't even give them this day is that correct I, I, be, I believe I'd asked that question before. We talked about this before. There's other counties that don't give this day. We've we've chosen to give this day to help them, but there's other counties that don't. Okay, if I may. High school teachers, particularly English teachers, are giving very long, they're very long exams. I know as an elementary teacher reading 33 essays on a weekend for five hours, that it takes a long time to do these things. We are already under huge constraints and workload. Let's add some more. This is a huge problem for us. You wanna add more and more on, 
we keep doing more and more with less and less and less, there's, this is going to be another straw that breaks the camel's back. I'm just giving you the message. You're yeah. going to hear it from them later when and this happens. Yeah. It, it, why do something that's going to be detrimental to a workforce that's already so heavily burdened by so much workload and not enough time to get stuff done as it is? That's all I'm saying. So, you know, I it's up, it's that. up yeah. to you all. Thank but you. I really strongly recommend that you do not do this. Thank you. Richard, before you sit down, I just want to clarify to make sure that I understood you correctly. The 19th through 22nd, the half days of January. Right. I'm a high school teacher. I give an exam. I have those exams <clears throat> to grade in those two to four hours after school. Right. And then the next day I roll in and I give another exam. I have another pile, et cetera, right. and so forth. And the I, first pile is still kind of there because you probably didn't finish. Right. Especially everything. as an English teacher, right. I know it takes about 10 to 15 minutes per essay yeah. to grade. Um, so the 22nd after school they wouldn't be moving their classrooms they'd be grading the exams from that friday well, okay they well, wouldn't have any time those four days in january to be getting their classroom changed uh, for the next semester because they'd be grading exams right. is what you're saying exactly and they used to high school teachers used to have two days to get their classroom together while right. the middle and elementary school teachers were right. at professional development right okay mr jackson so yes, C give me again some recommendations that you would have on fixing this then. Well, we've been saying the 181st student day is a good place where you could do this. MSEA day, but I understand uh, it's not in the same semester. I don't know how that works. Um, you know, honestly, I, I don't know where else it could come from. I, I just know that it would be detrimental to, to educators when they're trying to get work done and get started in a new semester um mrs birch i just checked I just, two other calendars it. um <laughs> perhaps we could find out from um, montgomery county and howard county montgomery county has one day at their semester break and howard county has no days off for students at semester break perhaps we could find out from their teachers how they handle grading and switching their classrooms at semester break um, so that we could get some ideas for our teachers to help them handle that um, because um, you know apparently they don't have an issue with it so perhaps we could ask for some guidance so that our teachers don't struggle with it this is Richie the problem with 181 days is I don't need to know who my teacher is at the end of 180 days I already you know I mean so so that's an issue and I understand what they're saying but I also understand that there's other school systems that don't even have them we give two days for that so I think that um, it is a workload issue it is a concern and hopefully we can work to make that happen but at the same time I know that for many years parents have been asking for the ability to meet their second semester teachers and they haven't had that ability and so here's an opportunity that you know, we, we, we want parents involved in schools, but only sort of like when we say it's okay. And, and that's not okay, especially in high school. I mean, you've got to really get kids and parents involved. If we're talking about the achievement gap, if we're talking about graduation rates, if we're talking about making sure parents are involved, you know, and yes, I know the argument is, well, those parents aren't going to be the ones that necessarily show up, but you know what? They might be. And we have to start changing the culture. And the culture is, we need you to be involved and we need you to know what's going on. No, not just in September, but in February and in January and in March and all those other times in between. So I, I fully understand that we're asking teachers to take one of those days away and consolidate. I, and I understand that. But at the same time, I also understand that we will never close the achievement gap if we do not start doing things differently. And if we do not start actively involving those people in our community who will help us to make that happen. And, and so I, I fully sympathize with the fact that that's happening. But at the same time, I understand we have to start doing something differently. Mrs. Birch. One more final thought, just on, not so much on the calendar, but on the whole um, moving to four conferences. Um, 
if we could look at our kindergarten teachers who already have two additional conferences that maybe they wouldn't necessarily do all four conferences because I can't see having six conferences a year for a, I mean that just seems a little excessive to have because they do one in August and they do one in May already and then they do the November one so then if you're doing one in each marking period as well at, I mean I just it just seems like it might be a little a little overkill to have a parent in six times during the year just just a thought to put out there to those that are planning this out <laughs> if if we um, took away the 181st day then schools would end on June 16th for middle and elementary but we'd still have to have the high school students going till the 17th correct because they're closed for graduation day yes. so that's that option would be very confusing maybe yes. right <laughs> all right uh, there's no more comments so we have a motion on the floor that's been properly made and seconded all those in favor the motion passes five zero zero I would like to to add that I, I liked Teresa's idea that we look into Montgomery and Howard how their teachers are handling the switch and the transition Thank you. item 4.04 .04 is an information to action item um, food nutrition services pricing for the school year 2015-16 do I have a motion to move this from information to action Second. all those in favor we now have an action item dr. Alato your recommendation Yes, ma'am. I recommend no increase in the food and nutrition services pricing for the school year 2015 2016. Uh, Mrs. Ritchie. This has nothing to do with the pricing. Uh, I just wanted to uh, publicly say again there's a lot of um, uh, angst about our, our food and about you know how bad it is, and that we're making all these fat children with our with our horrible food in the cafeteria and so I would challenge anybody who believes that our food is not nutritionally sound and isn't tasty to take the opportunity to join their child for lunch one day and have a meal that they're having in the cafeteria um, you can have all the fruits and vegetables you want so that's a that's a plus uh, maybe you'll get there on a day when they're having orange chicken that would be you know be great too and you know it's it's about perception I, I when I first came on this board my my key line was perception is reality and and as I f come to the end of my five years um, I find that that's still an apropos thing perception is reality I can tell you that food probably wasn't really the best when I uh, was partaking of some of those meals but it wasn't because they didn't try to make it good it was because it's institutional food and that sometimes happens but I believe that our nutrition and food service has done an excellent job in trying to provide an opportunity for a variety of food and a variety of taste and so I would um, and and for you know three bucks you, you can't beat that really I'm telling you that's it's a good and and I had that because the first school visit we went on they said you're gonna have lunch and I thought oh my god I better eat a big breakfast because I ain't eating this and it was I, I was it was it was really very good it really was very tasty and I mean the the rice that they had was really good that went with the chicken I mean it was just it was delicious I, I know I say that over and over but I really would challenge anybody who has not eaten a, a meal at the school to take an opportunity to, to do that and because uh, I think you'll see a world of difference so thank you for keeping the prices low and thank you for making sure that our children have nutritional sound meals is there any public comment on this item all those in favor motion passes five zero zero thank you we now have three review items 5.01 the avid program update Now, hopefully we can change the air in the room and make it a little more light. 
because we have fabulous news. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Jen Lombardi. I'm coordinator of AVID for Anne Arundel County Public School. At the AVID office is here today to share how our AVID program is advancing and embracing the mission of Anne Arundel County Public Schools and moving the vision of the superintendent forward. It is because of your support and the county support of the AVID program that students in the academic middle are supported every day in what they do. In fact, we are eliminating achievement gaps through targeted recruitment of historically underrepresented student groups and then opening access to rigorous courses and supporting those students as they persevere through. Every AVID site is preparing students to be college ready and they're doing this by taking students who are not academically independent and moving them towards independence and self-sufficiency in the learning process. AVID seniors leave Anne Arundel County Public Schools prepared for college. They're ready to think and read critically, question for understanding, collaborate for a common goal, and persevere for success. You might say, how do you know this? What is your evidence? Well, we have evidence. Last year, 88% of our AVID seniors had taken an AP course and sat for the exam with no disparities amongst student groups. This is up since our first graduating class in 2007, it was 36%. We make continual growth. We are continuing to strive for 100% because it's for every child. We work towards refining our support systems because there are gaps in the exam scores for our, some of our student groups and we recognize that and we are continuing to work on what support systems are needed to move all students to achieving at high levels. Our AVID students earn scholarship and grant money to make their college dream a reality. Last year, 365 AVID seniors earned $11.3 million, up $5 million from the year before. So far this year, we have 505 AVID seniors, two of which are sitting right next to me, and they have earned more than $17 million in scholarships and we have a month to go. Once in college, our AVID seniors persevere as successful AVID students. How do we know this? Our 2010 graduating class of AVID seniors, 77% of them enrolled in a four or a two year university the following year. Of that 77%, 88% of them continued for a second year of college. That persistence data is amazing. There were no gaps between student groups and actually our Hispanic group was 100% that continued to the following year. The third year for that same group, 72% continued. There were some disparities for Hispanic and socioeconomically disadvantaged students and the AVID office is looking into what resiliency strategies can we help support students so they have a third year plan. But the third year plan could have been, I finished my two years nursing degree at Anne Arundel Community College, I'm going to work for this hospital and they are gonna pay for my continued education. So we really have to look at what are the individual student needs and how, because we might not need to be doing anything differently. The two avid seniors sitting next to me are going to do great things for Anne Arundel County and for our world around us. Jonathan Cogdale is a Gates Millennium Scholar. He is from Old Mill High School and Tavon Algren is from Arundel High School and Tavon has earned more than $90,000 in scholarship money to support his college dream. So I would like to have the students share with you. Jonathan. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Jonathan Cogdale and I'm here to tell you about my AVID journey and how I've implemented the lessons I've learned in AVID into my academic journey over the years. I joined AVID in seventh grade. Miss Anderson drafted me in. I had some friends that were in AVID and on my way to my next class because we would leave from gym class and pass by her class. 
um, I would stop in there and talk to my friends for a little bit, and then, I would, and then she got used to seeing me. And um, she asked me if I wanted to join Avid. She asked me what my grades were, were looking like, and I, had, I was an AB student, still am AB, never missing an honor roll. And um, she had organized with my counselor that I get into the Avid program the next semester, and I had been in ever since. Um, in the middle school, what we really focus on, what, what was emphasized in our program was taking Cornell notes right and um, learning how to problem solve with tutorials. And um, we all knew that what the importance of taking Cornell notes were as we needed to make sure that we wrote down our notes first and then asked questions later so that we could emphasize what the lesson was about and making sure that the essential question was there, making sure that for tutorials the questions were at least level two, not level one, not something that you can just find in a textbook, but something that you really have to think deeply about. And that also helps you retain the information as well. We would watch a video about corner notes to make sure that we're taking them properly, that we um, go back and make the revisions that we need to make and any abbreviations, any corrections, any highlights, anything that we think should be emphasized before we take our test. And, um, and that, was, that carried on throughout the high school. And um, we started to emphasize more on the college application process starting our junior year. And we had started, we had wrote our, we, written, we had written our um, essays for the Common App our junior year. And we had, uh, our teacher had stored them for us. So next year when we came back our senior year coming, um, starting near the start of November, we had brought them back out and we just added anything else that we had um, achieved over the summer or in the first few months of our senior year. And we had put that into their essay to make it more impressive for the colleges, of course. And she really, Miss Gordon, she really worked hard to make us experts in the, co in the college application process and making sure that we didn't stray away from answering the actual question because we, she knew and we know now that when we're writing the essays for our colleges, they want to know us as well as they can without us being in the room. And we know that they need to be able to make a character analysis of who they're letting into their school through actually answering the question. And it was emphasized that we have to make sure not to go off on a tangent because it's really easy to do that, especially when you're writing about yourself, and to not go off on a tangent and make sure that you're actually answering the question. And I applied to 18 schools, and I've been accepted into 15, and I'm leasing, leaning towards Misericordia University in the fall. I'm looking into going to, into nursing. They have a four-year nursing program there, and I'm excited to start my um, academic journey in college. One more thing. Oh, a couple, couple more things I wanted to add is that with AVID, it wasn't just about corner notes, tutorials, and the college application process. It was also about carrying that out into the school. So in our, our AVID program, Ms. Gordon has set up an AVID house program. So we had house leaders, and they were in the names of colleges in Maryland. And it was, it was an incentive program. So we would have AVID dollars. And they had the faces of our teachers on the dollars. So we had ones, fives, tens, twenties. And um, I was one of the leaders for Howard House. We came in second, unfortunately. Salisbury won. But it was to give us, like, avid dollars. We got avid dollars for stuff like getting honor roll or principal's honor roll or getting accepted to a college or receiving scholarship money. <laughs> and um, we had planned a field trip at the end for the, for the house leaders and the people who had participated in the fundraiser. We did like a, um, a bake sale type thing. And um, another thing that was, that kind of strayed off of our AVID program is the AVID mentor program. Mr. Hansen is my counselor and he's AVID counselor. And he had set it up so that he took some leaders within the AVID program and helped the students. During advisory, we met once a week. We helped students that were struggling in AVID. Some of them were on probation, so we're working right now with them to get them back into the AVID program. And um, I'm one of the mentors. And um, it was really good to be able to be a part of that and see improvement in their grades. And we would look at their grade sheets and we would highlight the things that we thought they could redeem more points on. And 
it was good that they um, actually tried. And we stayed on top of them, made sure that they used that time during Pride period and after school to bring their grades up. Thank you, Jonathan. Trayvon? Um, hello, I, my name is Trayvon Algren. I am currently a senior at Arundel High School. I've been an avid since I was in the sixth grade, um, and it's helped me tremendously. Um, going into avid, I wasn't really sure what it was. I mean, my parents have heard about it before, I had, and it was one of those things that, like, I wasn't really 100% sure, but mother was more so, like, try it out and see if you'd like it. So I continued throughout middle school and high school, and just helped mold me to become a person that I never thought I'd become. Um, AVID has helped with my organization tremendously. Um, I wasn't really goal-oriented going into high school, but AVID has really helped me set high goals for myself, not necessarily getting into a college, but more so of what are you doing afterwards. Um, I am second generation to go to college. Both of my parents attended college, but they had me at a young age, so it was kind of hard balancing college and a child at the same time. So there was be times where I need that help from my parents, but they didn't really have the answers for me. And there'd be times where, well, during the college application for, like process, for example, where I would ask my parents for like, what are they asking for? Or what should I put here? And my mom would swiftly answer, you should go and ask your avid teacher. So yeah, it really help, helped with the college process and applying for colleges and more so of sculpting you to be an adult and going to college prepared. Um, well, I have applied to not really a lot of schools. I w applied to the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, and I got accepted there. Um, they're offering me $5,000 yearly to attend their school, and that was my first choice. I was also offered $60,000 by Johnson & Wales University to attend their school, but again, the Culinary Institute is my first choice. So. <laughs> Um, I have dreams of becoming an executive chef one day, um, and I think AVID will help me further those skills and actually help me achieve my goals that I've set for myself way down the line. I think I set that goal when I was in the ninth grade. When, like, we would research schools in AVID, like, we do that all the time. We would research colleges, and I didn't really know what college I wanted to go to and they had college visits, college tours. There's been schools that I kind of liked and I could see myself going to but I think the Culinary Institute is definitely where I belong and I am ecstatic to attend them. So yeah. Um, we'd be pleased at this time to answer any questions you may have. Mrs. Ritchie. Yeah, of course. You know. uh, I, I love Avon. I think that um, I, I'm so glad that it's grown as well as it's grown in our in our county and that uh, we have two fine examples right here. A Gates Millennium winner. I mean, forget Finals. about it. I, you know, it's, it's just that's unbelievable. And um, Ninety was it ninety thousand dollars? Yeah, uh, your parents are over the moon right now. By the way, uh, yeah, they're real happy you're going to college, but they're real, real happy that you got all those scholarships. And 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 the fact is, is that things change as we go on, and and so to have this opportunity at this level, I remember in elementary school at the end of the school year, cleaning out the school desk, and it was this one little boy. I, I remember specific, and it was cram packed. And when I emptied the desk out, it was the chronicle of the whole year. And now I understood why nothing got home, because starting in September all the way through. And so some people have natural organizational skills. Some people don't. And some people just need a way to help to, to shape that. And so this program is absolutely, I think, one of the best parts about that is, is helping you to understand why it's important to, to organize. 
Um, so glad you listened to mom because, <laughs> you know, that just reiterates that mom really does know best. But okay. But, but it helps you to understand, you know what I mean? So you be able to, you're able to take an opportunity and to do that. And the leadership that you have learned, whether you realized it or not, it is really going to serve you well as a nurse because you know that you you need to have a lot of good leadership skills in in that opportunity um it's, it's not real fun when you got somebody coding on the floor and everybody's going who what do we should do here nobody steps you know yeah, that'd be a problem. okay <laughs> been there done that so so to have the leadership skills is you know is absolutely essential and and what avid provides i just I'm sad that we can't open it up to more kids because I know that there's there's tons of them out there that want to do that. But I, I just I think that this is an absolutely wonderful program and one of the one of the one of the gemstones in, in the crown of the things that we do is 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 avid. I think personally because it does provide opportunities and it helps kids and then young adults to realize what their true potential is because sometimes we don't have people that can do that for us, but but we do always have somebody in AVID. So I, I'm just thrilled and, and congratulations to you both and, and the best of luck in both of your chosen fields. Thank you. Dr. Arletto. Thank you. Uh, that, that was fabulous. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for sharing your story. Um, that's, it's important for us to hear um, you and your story and what you're gonna do with your lives um, and how we have somehow contributed to that is our story. Right? We don't have a story without our students. And the fact that you come out here in public and share that, and share that with others as the years go on. And we had a young man here two weeks ago that shared part of his story. He's a graduate of Chesapeake High School, and then he went on to UMBC, and now he's going off to get his PhD at, at Cal Berkeley. That's really cool for us, right? This is, so this is a big deal for us in all aspects of the school system. 10,000 employees, our focus is you. And so when we can hear the stories about what in some way, shape, or form, we've contributed to where you're headed in life. Um, that's a huge reward for us. So I thank you. I thank Ms. Lombardi for her continued focus and efforts. Um, uh, Jonathan Trayvon, I wish you truly the best. Trayvon, uh, just some advice, heading off to CIA uh, up in Hyde Park. Dress warm. <laughs> My son is a freshman at Bard, which is just north on the Hudson, just north of Hyde Park, and he learned that the hard way. So. <laughs> Lots, so bundle up, but it's a fabulous place. It's a beautiful campus. Um, and every time we go up in the past year to visit our son at Bard, we try and make reservations at one of the three restaurants, and they're always full at CIA. My wife and I have not been able to eat there yet. So now that you're there, you're going to hook us up. You're going to hook us up. You're going to get us into one of the restaurants. I'll find you. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Jackson. Thank you, ma'am. To both of you, thanks. Thanks for sharing your story again. And to Ms. Lombardi, I just had a couple of questions that um, if you can maybe follow up um, with respect to the scholarships that you talked about, 11 million for last year, 17 million already with still some time left uh, for this year. Where are we seeing those across the AVID program across the district? And you don't necessarily have to answer that now, but and we've got AVID programs all across our district. Where are we seeing those numbers come in that make it, make up that 11 or that 17 million? Uh, so you're asking me um, what the 12 different high schools, yes, how it's dis dispersed? And, right. And um, if, at, for example, at Old Bell High School, they have 4 million. Um, and it most of our high schools are up this year over last year. Um, obviously, if they have as much as they do. Um, the large ones, um, Arundel High School, and I'm sorry, Annapolis High School has two million. Arundel High School has one million. Glen Burnie High, High School has one million. North County has above one million. I didn't have an exact number from them. Um, Northeast has 3.9 million. Mm -hmm. And they were, last year they were at 2.7 million. And Northeast has um, not one of the largest programs. It's a smaller school. These are just, um, at Northeast, it's 58 AVID seniors have earned more than 3.9 million. Um, Old Mill High School, 73 AVID seniors have earned 4 million. Um, South River, 46 have earned 1.5. Southern, 22 have earned 1.1. 1 .1. Okay. Does that, that help? Yes, oh, absolutely, when we're out kind of 
um, talking to various folks, uh, it helps to be able to capture. Um, and I can send this data to perfect. you. Perfect. Um, and then you mentioned some in, in your comments at the beginning, you said um, there's some persistence data mm -hmm. that you have. Um, could you share some of those details, not necessarily today, but maybe could you share some of that persistence data? Because it interests me very much so when you say 88 percent used the money uh, of those 80 or 80 after they got through college or the first year of college, I think is what you were saying. 88 percent stopped or 12 percent stopped using it after that first year. And then it dropped down after the second year of 70 something percent. So 20 something percent didn't use it. Um, maybe if you could quantify those numbers of people that are actually going out. And it's great we know, like, for example, 11 million earned it. But I'm also interested in how much of that 11 million was actually used by those students as they went through the first year and second year of college. Right. Does that make like sense? Like Trayvon has earned 90,000 to Correct. go to the Culinary Institute. He would only be using around 30 of it. Right. Well, I think he said for the one that he's going to go to, he's only going to use five. You've got five right now. For four years. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Five times four, 20. Right. Um, which is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just um, kind of like we talk about all the AP work that we're doing here and getting students into AP. But I want to start to understand and peel the onion back about how many of those students are getting threes, fours, and fives as opposed to we're just getting them in to take an AP class. So same way with scholarships. It's great that we highlight we've got $17 million worth of scholarships for this year, and we may have more. I want to understand how, many, how much of that money is actually being used by our AVID students as they go into their first, second, third, and fourth year of college. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. OK. Thank you. The difficulty, of course, will be it's exactly. become self-reported data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's yeah. we have to try and get a hold of the students, and they could call us back or not call us back. You guys are calling us back, right? <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. So we've got two. But so, so you understand. So that's yeah. part of it is when they leave us in the public school system, mm -hmm. we don't always we can't get the data we'd love to have to say as they go off from two year colleges to four year colleges, how they do, how they perform, what they do beyond that, how they use their scholarship money. It's all self-reported. We can reach out. Um, uh, but we don't have that sort of engine that we can sort of draw that data in it from our graduates. It becomes yeah. difficult for us. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank Jonathan, you. when you uh, come back, or you finish nursing school, if you come back to Anne Arundel Medical Center, let us know so we know we're in good hands. We know which hospital to go to, um, or Baltimore Medical Center, um, or the VA, or Debbie, go work with Debbie. I can work there. Just let us know where to go to get care. And uh, sure. Trayvon, when you've got a sh restaurant, when you're the executive chef, we want to know so we can come patronize it. Of course. And I, I just wanted to encourage you both. Um, a, a lot of people don't know this, but there is sort of an AVID program in college. It's called FYE, First Year Experience. So when you get that course catalog and you have to sign up for your classes for your freshman year, if you see anything that says FYE, that's like AVID, college level AVID. And you guys are probably well prepared, but you might make really good mentors to the kids that are in there that need that program and who might not have had the opportunity to have AVID in high school. So I just want to encourage you to look for that FYE. Okay. Definitely All, right. Something I'll be looking at. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any public comment on the AVID presentation? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next review item is 5.02, the county executives recommended FY 2016 operating and capital budget. Mr. Shaknovich. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Alex Shaknovich, Chief Operating Officer, uh, here to present a uh, brief overview as a review item of the uh, recently issued County Executive's recommended uh, FY 2016 operating and capital budgets. Uh, the budget as released on May the 1st, uh, 2015, as required by the County Charter. So I'd like to begin with a brief overview of the operating budget. We've taken the uh, county executive's uh, 
operating budget and distilled it down to this one page overview uh, that's up on the screen for your viewing pleasure. And let me simply orientate you to how the chart is laid out. So the top quarter of the chart speaks about revenue and moving from the left to the right, you'll see that we concluded our FY15 uh, year, or we will conclude it with an approved operating budget of $1,062,000,000. Uh, $1 when the board adopted uh, its budget request uh, this past winter to send forward to the county executive, the board requested a total operating budget of uh, $1,103,000,000, which is a $41.2,000,000 increase year over year from all sources, and that's inclusive of both restricted and unrestricted funds. The budget was uh, released, uh, the recommendation going forward to the County Council by the County Executive for the Board of Education then contained uh, $1,080,000,000 or an $18.2 million year-over-year -year increase. Again, that's from all sources. So diving a little bit deeper on the revenue front, you'll see that uh, the Board of Education from the federal government uh, had anticipated and therefore in, uh, asked for no increase uh, in federal government unrestricted funding. The county executive's uh, proposed budget does uh, agree in that regard, so it's a match. From the state, when the board uh, initially constructed its budget, as you may recall, uh, we were uh, operating under the uh, budget that was released by the governor at that time. So we anticipated receiving approximately four and a half million dollars uh, from the state of Maryland. Uh, thankfully, uh, through the General Assembly process and uh, some negotiations at the state, the revenue uh, the unrestricted revenue for Anne Arundel County was increased from four and a half million dollars to just under eight point seven million dollars, and that is in fact recognized within uh, County Executive Shoe's budget as well. Now, what is absent, as everyone does know, is uh, there still is that lingering question over the other half, the fifty-eight percent. I'm sorry, the uh, four point eight million dollars, the other fifty percent of the GCI that is undetermined and therefore it is not contained here. If, in fact, uh, that came to fruition, we've had some discussions with uh, our partners in county government. If that came uh, to fruition and was released by the uh, governor's office, and then we received notification to the extent that uh, our financial uh, folks and the state and the uh, county's financial folks could certify, verify, in fact, that that money is really there. If that would was to occur between now and the 12th of June uh, when the county has to conclude its budget uh, proceedings, we will work with the county government to recognize that additional revenue. Um, if it occurs at some point after uh, the county council has struck its budget, then we would most likely have to go to the county with a supplemental uh, request, supplemental funding request, but we do that each and every year anyway as we win grants that were not initially anticipated, et cetera. So we would go to the county um, at some point mid-year in FY16 to ask for that revenue to be recognized. Uh, naturally, if it is uh, not released by the governor at all, this is the number that will uh, guide us for the year ahead. From the county government, uh, the Board of Education requested an unrestricted uh, funding increase of 39.1 million dollars. The county executive's uh, budget is funded at 11, uh, just under $12 million, $11.98 million. Uh, the rest is a match. Uh, he concurred, his recommendation concurs with your request in terms of local funding and the use of our fund balance. And then in the restricted categories, the county executive's uh, fund uh, funding recommendation, again, is a match with what you requested. So again, netting together on the revenue side, that is that $18.155 million year-over-year -year increase. So where does it go? That's the revenue piece. The rest of the page, the bottom three quarters, talks about the expense or the distribution side of it. And I'll simply hit the highlights and, and leave the details for you and members of the public. Um, but of note, 
the Board of Education's adopted budget had requested funding uh, of approximately $14.6 million to fund a step increase for those uh, members eligible for a step increase uh, or a 2% COLA for some of the uh, labor units that do not have steps at all built into uh, their pay structure. So that was approximately $14.6 million. The county executive's recommendation has a 1% uh, compensation enhancement placeholder. Uh, the manner and distribution of that will be subject to uh, your guidance and your negotiations uh, with the uh, labor units and the superintendent's office for those non-represented employees. Going further down the page then, um, we do have another year of the mandated teacher pension shift. Uh, um, by mandate, we're required to send approximately $2.8 million to the state of Maryland to cover our local share of that uh, teacher pension shift and the county executive's budget does contain funding for that. Uh, the next notable item down below is the Monarch uh, Charter Contract School expansion. We, as you know, uh, we have a successful contract school that's operating in the Laurel area, the Monarch Global School, and they opened up with uh, a K through fifth grade complement and then they're scheduled in each successive year to bring on additional uh, grades until they're fully uh, rounded out at a K through eight complement. So we'd requested uh, $3.7 million to fund that uh, uh, contractual obligation, which we have with the children's school there to Monarch School that was not funded. And the rest I'll, I'll sort of group. You will see uh, beginning with the American Sign Language Interpreters and then continuing down the page there was uh, funding requests for approximately 133.8 positions. And rather than the county executive uh, picking and choosing uh, which specific programmatic categories uh, to fund or not to fund, uh, the strategy that was taken was to go ahead and convert the remaining money, the difference between the maintenance of effort budget and what was already uh, essentially spoken for and allow the support of 69 and a half uh, full-time equivalent positions and then the distribution of those the programmatic distribution of those so whether they were to go to pre-k or whether they were going to go to pyp or whether they were going to go to one of the uh the biomedical stem etc uh, that distribution ultimately would be uh, guided by decisions that this board of education and the superintendent make concurrently um, there are uh, 14 of those 69 and a half positions are revenue neutral. Uh, as you recall, the American Sign Language Interpreters and the non-public uh, positions, there are no cost implications for those. So that's simply a swap of contractual positions for uh, Board of Education employees. But the remaining 55.5 positions are in fact uh, new FTEs that uh, could be distributed uh, as the Board of Education and Superintendent see fit. Uh, the only uh, other notable uh, item of interest is there, you'll see a $750,000 line item. Uh, the county government uh, has had a capital uh, project in place to continue the expansion of their uh, wide area uh, network and to expand the number and the um, throughput on that uh, network of which we benefit as do the libraries the schools the fire departments the police stations all county government facilities so this will uh, certainly uh, help the county and therefore help the county help us continue with our uh, access to wide area networks the bottom uh, element is simply again a match uh, in the restricted category so they were a dollar for dollar match no change so in summation, the Board of Education requested in totality a year-over-year 3.88% uh, increase. The budget that's been recommended by the county executive would fund a 1.71% increase. And with that, I conclude my remarks as they relate to the operating budget. And if you're so inclined, Madam President, maybe we could discuss that and then set the operating budget aside, and then I'll resume with a brief overview of the capital budget. Mrs. Birch. 
Thank you. <clears throat> to say that I'm disappointed in the county executive's budget would be a bit of an understatement. Um, the county has provided us this year with $59 over maintenance of effort. Um, let me just explain what that means. We've gotten the exact same amount of money per student for the last seven years. My son was in kindergarten then. We're spending the same amount of money from the county to educate our students for as long as my son has been in our school system. I can guarantee you that it doesn't cost the same amount to support my child as it did when he was in kindergarten. I can also tell you that it doesn't cost the same amount of money to educate my child as it did when he was in kindergarten. But our county government believes that it costs the same amount of money to educate a child today as it did when my child was in kindergarten and he is in seventh grade now. So while the total amount of dollars have increased, that's only because our number of students have increased. There's been increased funding for the increased number of students. That increased funding doesn't allow for teacher raises. It doesn't allow for improved programs. It essentially is just to pay for the increased number of students over the last number of years. The reason we've been able to do any of those things is because we figured out how to save money, how to make do with less, how to do more with what we have. This year is no different. Don't be fooled. The county executive's budget outlines where the money should be spent in one part with a 1% for salary increase. But again, that's at the expense of the additional resources that our additional students need. This doesn't, this budget doesn't fund what we need. He said you can have with this extra money, which is not really extra money, what, 55 of the 134 positions that you asked for. The other 79, you can't have. The positions that your kids need, you can't have. The bilingual facilitators, additional pre-K teachers, English language acquisition teachers, our triple E expansion teachers for elementary students that are bringing them up to do their work at a higher level, special education teachers, classroom teachers for additional enrollment, school psychologists, our Monarch contract school expansion, and the funding for an early start time that the county executive said that he supported. Our kids deserve better. All of our students deserve better. What disappoints me the most is that our $59 over maintenance of effort budget comes from a county budget that included a $19 million tax cut. I understand that a property tax cut was also a campaign promise, but I'm concerned that saving property owners an average of $100 a year is happening at the expense of our children. The other thing that concerns me is that our share of the state foundation formula went down this year because our county's relative wealth went up. The state's formula is based on a number of items, including our county's wealth and effort. Effort basically means that you're taking advantage of what you have in your county, your taxable base. By lowering our tax rate this year, I think we're gonna get hit again next year because we're not taking advantage of our wealth. We lowered our taxes. So our effort has gone down. So this means our state funding will likely take a hit again next year, and our share of the state foundation formula will go down. Are we cutting our taxes at the expense of our kids? Is that $100 average worth losing 79 positions, three bilingual facilitators, 14 pre-K teachers for early childhood literacy, an EEO ADA compliance officer, 10 ELA staff, 27 triple E teachers, six PVA teachers, one PYP teacher, five special ed teachers, four early childhood special education teachers, eight STEM biomedical education teachers, 33 teachers for increased enrollment, 
three technology support technicians, two high school psychologists, $1.2 million to start school later, and our contractual obligation to the Monarch Contract School. Is that $100 worth losing all of those things? I believe our kids are worth more. It's time to invest in our kids. Mrs. Ritchie. Uh, very well said, Ms. Burge. Um, so technically, what you said is, is correct, but also technically he did give us the money. It's just how we choose to, not for the full thing, he gave us $4 million, which is 55 positions. We've at, is that, am I reading that right? Make sure I'm reading that right. 4.1 million for we, 55 positions. In terms of position control, we actually have position control for 69 and a half okay. uh, of the 133.8 positions that you asked for. Okay, so that's, that's 13 million then. So we have, so we, ha we wanted 36 million for the 133 positions and we got for 69, which is 13 million. And now we have to choose what we're gonna do with that 13 million. So when the school start time people go and say, you didn't put money in for transportation software, he can say, yes, he did. Yeah. We chose not to, to use it or to start the school. Yeah, because he did. I mean, technically he can. No, he put it in salaries. He didn't put it in No, no, technically, because if he left these all zero for us to decide where we wanted to put the money. Is that right? No. Only partially. Um, okay. So the, the money is distributed amongst uh, the 14 state categories. So um, the funds that were distributed, the funds that this budget represents principally fall into uh, really only four main categories. They fall into the instructional salary category where the bulk of the teachers and the compensation increases. Uh, they fall into the fixed charges category, which is where your pension and retirement uh, planning is. They fall into the operations of plant, because that's $750,000 uh, for the cable uh, expansion, falls into operation of plant. And then the 1% compensation placeholder is, in fact, spread across many of those categories, because even, even uh, one of our uh, custodial workers, uh, one of our special educators, et cetera. So, it really falls there. There is not in the transportation category. Our transportation state category did not go up uh, one and a quarter million dollars. Okay. So that funding is not in that column. What? Because this is a game of words. Okay. This is what this is. Is this is a game of words? And what's going to happen is, we're going to say we didn't get the money, and the county executive is going to say, "But I gave you money, and you have to decide where to use it." So, so that's. So what I want people to understand is that. While they may say they gave money for school start time, that's, they did not give us the money to fund everything. We have to choose what we want to fund. So I, 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 it's a game of words. How much money that is not, okay, we're, when I'm looking at this thing here, when I'm looking at the, you'd think I'd be able to get this by now, but I just can't seem to get it. Um, when you look at this, we asked, we asked they gave us $13 million. That's the difference between, we asked for, uh, $36, $36 million was unrestricted, right? Yes, ma'am. So we actually got $13 million, and th that 36, that helps to do some of the, no. How much is the total? Okay, let me, let me, let me ask this maybe. Yeah, that's right. $36 million was the unrestricted funds, which would total, would fund all of the things that we had requested, the 133.8 positions. Yes, which then does all of the things that we want to do. They gave us four, 13, that's not including, is that including the 1% that's 13 million? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right, I just want to ask. So they gave us 13 million, which includes a 1% placeholder and will fund 69.5 of the 133 positions that we've asked for. And if I heard you correctly, 14 of the 69 positions I, I maybe I didn't understand. We that's their cost neutral. Yes, we asked we asked for a cost neutral shift to move away from contracted services okay. towards self performing, and the county executive's budget concurs with our request. So really, we only get new fifty five positions. At a you, yes, ma'am. Because if right. you subtract fourteen from sixty nine, you get fifty five. Yes, ma'am. Okay, 
So that, that's what I'm trying to. So of the 133 positions that are new positions, we're only going to get 55 of them. The, the 14 cost neutral positions were also in 133. Okay. They, they were in both. Okay, columns, so 69. So. so, but we can only then choose, well, you know, so, and that's what I'm trying to get to is that I'm trying to really make it real easy because it's a game of words and we know it's a game of words. So, when the school start time people who came here today wanted to know what we were going to, technically, the money, if we choose to put the money there, is there. We have to make the choices of nope. where we're going to put the money. That, that is not correct, ma'am. Okay. So you, um, the state category for transportation does not have the funding in it to support uh, okay. the acquisition of, it does not have the additional money to support the acquisition of the software or the programmer or the start time. Okay, well that's uh, what that, I'm, I'm so trying to get we to. Don't, we don't have the additional appropriation authority. I, I believe I believe the intent from the Board of Ed, and if I'm misstating it, Madam President, you please correct me, but I believe the intent was to have uh, that funding be funded above maintenance of effort, and then that funding above maintenance of effort be put into the tr state category for transportation to the tune of about one point uh, three million dollars, but we were only funded at slightly above maintenance of effort. But that category didn't receive that above MOE increase that I believe was the intent of the board when they made their initial request. Yeah, because when I'm looking at this right here, that's on this board here, transportation routing and contract pay software. We'd have to have one person, so we've asked for that person seventy three thousand seven hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars. For, for that, okay, and then if you look down here, it says transportation contracts for later start time, $600,000. That's all in here with this 13, I mean, yeah, $13,000, I mean, $13 million, right? Or is it in the wrong category? It's in so the wrong, that's, it's in the wrong so, category. So, well, it's but in the wrong is, category for transportation. This is the piece of information that's going out to the public. So when the county executive is asked about that, he can sit there and say, well, I put it right here, look. Okay, but if it's in the wrong category, we need to make people understand it's in the wrong category because that's exactly what it says here. So of this, of this $13 million, these 69 positions, we're gonna have to look in here and say, well, if we wanna have three bilingual facilitators, that takes away from the 69. So now that leaves us 66, if that's what we choose to do with it because now we have to choose what we're going to do, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so those two pieces are in this, this, this line here, this, this whole category thing. So I think we need to make sure that people understand they're not part of the, they're not part of this because they have to be in a separate category. Right, I, I would just, again, want to try to clarify something and maybe I'm, I'm doing a poor job of it. Um, it's not that it's in the wrong category. The, the transportation category, the amount of funding that we'd asked for in the transportation category was $1.3 million, essentially more than the county executive's request. That $1.3 million more would have come as a result of being funded above maintenance of effort. We were not funded above maintenance of effort, so that category shrunk back to what the base budget is, which okay. is the way we exist today, essentially. So I see what they've done. They've done what they've done is everything that we may have asked for above in any of the categories. They've all put it all into this one right here and said, "Here's your pot of money. You all decide where you want to do it." But we necessarily can't necessarily do that. Is that what you're saying? Yes. If I could, if I could jump in, um, we can spend it as we like, as long as it stays in the category of, correct me if I'm wrong, in salaries. Okay. So when we come to any of those positions, you talked about it could be PVA, it could be bilingual facilitators. Right. Any of those, as long as we're talking about spending those 55.5 positions, those dollars, that $4.1 million, million, 
as long as it's in staffing. Oh, for, for me, yeah. But we could not take from that four point one million dollars, and this is to okay. to buy software, okay, or to purchase more busing contracts to change start times. We couldn't do that as long as it stays in salaries. Okay. We could do that, but we couldn't purchase something outside of salaries with that money because it's in that item. And is that's that that's 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 an extremely important piece of information because people need to understand that when you send 25,000 emails to me and telling me to put it in there, we can't do it because it's not in the, in the, because we can only use it for, so we can't buy a contract. We can't get a software person when we can't even afford to buy the software. I mean, why would you buy a, why would you, why would you have a person? I don't want to say buy a person. Why would you have a position for a person in a trend that, that we can't even buy the software for? So, so we can't even buy the software because that money was not funded in here, right? Uh, I, I, because, you know, let's go past, we've had people in here, all of them out here talking about that. We asked for it. The way that they have presented this appears to look like now it's our responsibility to take that $602,000 and buy the contract, but we can't. We can, we can get the person. But why would you have a person if you have no software and we have no ability to buy the contracts, right? Is that okay? I, I just want to be real, real clear about that because you know, right? We're going to get emails, so I just want to be real clear about that. So, and now what we have to do is take that fifty-five, the the fifty-five people, and we have to decide of these positions, which not we, you all have to sit and figure out and bring Correct. us information about that so that we can make a, a knowledgeable thing because you know we have to decide whether we're going to have the three bilingual facilitators or instead we're going to have four early special ed because we've only got 55 people and and 33 of them would be for enrollment i mean so we need 33 people just to keep class sizes where they are now which are still high but it, it but we need to is that right it, it, I mean, it is, it is both. Sure. That is correct. We, though, and we said this publicly when we released the budget, we've had several conversations with Ms. Ritchie, so I appreciate you bringing it up. That 33 positions doesn't even, that does not match the number we truly need no. to get to where we would like to have class sizes based on the 1,100 more students. Right. That was a conservative. We peeled that number back in order to make the numbers work and to be and have a more conservative um, uh, right. a budget with regards to our request. That's why I said we to keep them at basically where they are. And the reason I'm saying all this is because tonight at North County High School, they're having the county council is having their hearing because now the county now the county council gets this budget and they get to put their fingers in here and do what they want to do. So at North County High School, they're hearing about this. I can guarantee that the people who are, you know, that squeaky wheel, and I, you know, I, I know I'm going to get hate letters, but I don't care. The fact is, is that we need 33 people to just keep class sizes where they sort of are now. It won't address any overcrowding. It won't address it. It just addresses the fact that we've got these more kids. What'd you say it was? 1100. 1100. I thought you said 1100. I just want to make sure I was right. You know, me and numbers. So I just want to make sure people understand because when I go there tonight, that's what they're going to be doing. They're going to be asking for a school start time. And, and the fact is, is that we can't even get the contract because we don't have the money. We can hire a person and they can sit there all year long and do nothing because we don't have a, the stuff. Uh, okay, I'm done. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> you know, we can be disappointed in these numbers. Um, but as Ms. Burge said, um, all, MOE is all we've gotten as a Board of Education. That's all we've received for the last seven years. So to think anything different in our current environment um, is um, something that we ought to consider. We've gone through three county executives. We've gone through uh, several county councils. And that's all we've gotten. Okay, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't express what they're not going to get, but this is just the start of the collaborative conversation that we need to have with our council members. And so, you know, 55.5 is what they've put in the budget. So what does that get us? I need the administration to tell me 
what are the priorities of the 55.5? Once I understand what the priorities are of the 55.5 FTE edition, then I can start to have a collaborative conversation with my county council member and with other county council members to say, this is what we're not going to be able to do. This is not what we're going to be able to, to go fund because we don't have any more money. But it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in this room that follows this conversation for the last near decade that maintenance of effort or short thereof, in this case this year, $59. Last year or year before that, it was $24 or whatever it was. We're not in this county going to receive some massive amount of money over maintenance of effort. It's not the will of the people that continue to put the certain folks into office. So, having said that, Ms. Burge asked a question that I wrote down. Very good question. Are we cutting our taxes at the expense of our kids? Facts are, if we didn't get $18 million off of a campaign promise off from the county executive, those dollars are not going to come to the county school system anyway. So the answer to that question is no because the county council and the county executive are not going to fund over maintenance of effort relative to more than $59 in this county. So what we have to be able to do as a board, as a superintendent, as the administration, is to appropriately, very collaboratively, articulate what we can't do. And so as I start that conversation here, starting tonight at North County, as you have mentioned, um, is I hope to have an understanding of what our county is not going to be able to go do relative to our school system without any more funds. And so, it, it, you know, what I would like to see is, one, uh, what we're not going to be able to do based off of the county executive's recommendation. I asked for the exact same thing last year. I didn't get it until after the county council struck their vote on now this is what we're not going to be able to go do. I'm hoping this year we'll be able to get that information relatively quickly so that we can start to have some of those conversations about priorities with our county council. And then the second thing that I'm most interested in getting that I would like to see sooner rather than later is this broken down in the 14 state categories relative to the board request, requested base budget, and the county executive funding of that uh, of that base budget and what he didn't fund by category, 14 state categories, so that I can also see, and I think it would help to articulate this amount of money is in personnel, salaries, it's not in transportation, and then we can have those conversations with our community and the community can have those conversations both with the county executive and the county council. because. It's not going to change. Next year, we may get $100 over maintenance of effort. But right now, we're in a tax cap revenue, tax revenue cap in this county. That's where we are. Thank you. Mrs. Ritchie. I did have a question, and I meant to ask this before I went on my little tangent. Um, the $4.8 million that you're talking about, the GCI, that would not then be, they wouldn't, that, that comes from the state, okay? That $4.8 million then would not be, $4.8 million wouldn't be shaved off of this budget. Is that right? Correct. Our, okay. our total operating budget would increase by an additional $4.8 million. Okay. That's, the, that's, the county could not go, just because we received $4.8 million from the state, the county cannot go under maintenance of effort, so their funding would remain stable. We would simply, uh, the state line would increase. And uh, just to take a little stab and at the, at the, uh, the reason we've been able to do what we've done is because our teachers have worked harder, because we've cut back in administration and people with support staff that we've needed to do. We, we've not filled positions that we needed to fill that would have not made it easier, what, but would have just made the days not quite as long as they, they, they are. And we have done a lot of, um, you know, really sucking in and tightening up the belt string, belt the, to make sure that things happen because 
we would do our children a disservice if we said, well, you know what, we can have PVA in middle school, but too bad, can't have it in high school. I don't know whether Ms. Korbelak's daughter would have then been the only high school student who had a film in the film, in the Annapolis film thing at that time, had she not, ha I, I kind of maybe think she would, but I, because I know her mom, but, um, but I mean, what I'm just saying is, is the opportunities. Be the reason we have done what we've done every time, because I thought that too, I thought, well, you know, we asked for this money, but then we still do it anyway. But that's because we've sucked it up. You know, quite frankly, we've sucked it up. And we've done what we needed to do because that's what we do for kids. And I, I can't any longer say, you know, I mean, we, we, I can't any longer say that it's okay. Seven years of just getting that, it, it's time for that, us to start changing the conversation. It's time for the, the citizens of this county who believe that education is important, who want to have, you know, we talk about open for business, we talk about having uh, opportunities here for young people and, and businesses to move into our county. They're not gonna move here if the school system isn't good, if they don't have affordable housing, and if we don't have good jobs for them. And if we don't have those things, it's not going to happen. We're having conversations, but remember, the county council cannot add to this budget. They can just move things around. They can't add any money. So the money we have is the money we have. Isn't that right? Oh, oh. no, God, and he's going to tell me an Alex answer. So by, by county charter, the county, uh, the county council, so the, the county executive sets the revenue number, sets the maximum uh, expenditure to county council can in fact oh. add to uh, the education category uh, but unfortunately that would have to come at the expense of some other agency so the right. county uh, council uh, would have to so the desperately needed new firehouse that we need or the potholes that we need filled on 100 because my car is being knocked it's all out of alignment all the time and and the fire and the police station and the training areas that we need that we desperately need to keep the county safe we would have to take that much so then we we're going to pit groups against each other we're going to pit the fire department against the police department against the the education department that's not what we want to do that's not what we want to do at all and I will never understand it. I will never get it. This, the whole wealth index thing, I, I just, it's, my brain is not made for math. I've, I've come to that realization. It took me a lot of years, but my brain is not math. I'm sorry, Dr. Kubik, but it's not. It's just not made for math. But I, I trust the people whose brains are made for math. And when you talk about the wealth index, because everybody likes to talk about how bad we are, how poor we are. Well, evidently somebody's made a calculation somewhere that says, no, we're not. So it's time for us to, to meet our obligation for students. I'm gonna stop. Mrs. Birch. I just wanted to real quick say that this isn't just about our tax cap because we actually could have, I mean, we didn't have to lower our tax rate this year. I mean, that was, that was a choice that was made. Um, that was about lowering our taxes. We could have collected $18 million more um, that that was a conscious decision and I, I just I do think that um, if if people do believe in education and if they they do need to call the, the county executive and the county council and let people know that they think these things are important because I don't think that they're hearing that I think that they think that everyone just wants their hundred dollars and I really think that there are a lot of people out there who can see the difference between having an extra hundred dollars, which means what, going out to dinner a couple times? And, and yeah, depending upon where you're eating, if you're going out somewhere really nice, it's not even going out once, but going out to dinner a couple times and between your child having a quality education. Um, I figured it out, each child this year was worth to our county point zero 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 seven four cents. That's all they're worth. I think our kids are worth a lot more, and I think you should tell our elected officials. Thank you. I just have a couple questions. Um, do you happen to have the figures of what was in the transportation category for FY15 versus what's proposed for 16? I do back in my office, not, not with me for this okay. presentation. But that's the information Mr. Jackson uh, asked for 
that will be included in that. We'll give you all the categories just like it was requested, so be self-evident at that time. And then this additional um, 4.8 million that may come from the state in GCEI, I know people have also suggested that we could just use that to buy this transportation software and the additional buses, but isn't GCEI meant to help educate our more impoverished children? Is that kind of the intent back when it was established? Like for pre-K and? Yes, ma'am, a, a lot of, um, obviously the uh, GCI was established to recognize the fact that it is more expensive to educate a youngster, uh, for example, in the Baltimore-Washington corridor as it is uh, possibly in the far reaches of the Eastern Shore or Western Maryland. Uh, it's fundamentally the cost of living here, doing business here, everything costs more up and down the BWI corridor than in other parts of the state. So uh, that funding would is really to support the schoolhouse, you know, initiatives. And our county now has almost a third of its students as free and reduced lunch children. So yep. that yes, is also increasing the number of pre-K students we need to educate that's not a part of this funding MOE formula, correct? Uh, on the revenue side, it is not, again, the superintendent of the board certainly can take some of the positions that we've received right. funding for and allocate it to that if that is the will of the superintendent of the board. Um, and I just want to kind of reiterate so it doesn't get lost, didn't get lost in all of our conversation. The media and the county executive office continue to portray this extra 12 plus million dollars as this pot of money that we can spend as we please. But unless it is put in one of those 14 state categories, we can't just spend it like we would our own checking account. We're not depositing it into a checking account and writing checks however we please. And as you stated, that money has gone into instructional salaries, fixed charges, operations, and plant, and that's it. This additional money. Essentially, yes. So we can't. A absent the 1% raise, because the 1%, I'm sorry, not raise, but 1% compensation placeholder does touch multiple categories because we have employees in many, many, many of those categories. Okay. So except for that, you're absolutely spot on correct. All right. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Yeah, just to clarify, I want to make sure I understand something. The um, fund balance uh, in the adjusted BOE approved FY15 is $20 million. Uh, but we requested 12.5 million. How much do we believe at this particular point? Now we're in May, and we've only got um, a month and maybe 20 days left in the fiscal year, school fiscal year. Um, how much do we believe we're actually going to have in the in the uh, fund balance? We're actually undertaking those uh, calculations right now, and we will have that figure uh, for you as we do each and every year at your very next board meeting. Okay. Um, okay, good. Um, thank you very much. And there will be an agenda item on your next board meeting. Are we get, I mean, okay, got it. Fair enough. And then um, uh, to answer uh, kind of one of the, or to give my comments relative to something that was said uh, a few minutes ago um, from Ms. Ritchie, we have dug in and we found savings in order to do PVA, PVA expansion, STEM, you know, all of these wonderful programs for our children. And you ask the question of, you know, how have we done that over the last seven years? You know, the bottom line is we've led. At the end of the day, the county council is going to strike a budget, and we have people in this school system, administrators, uh, principals, and so forth, that have led all seven years in order to create the savings, in order to be able to do all the way down into the teachers in the classroom to do what they need to do to educate kids. That's real leadership. That's leadership at the staff level. That's leadership at the superintendent level. That's leadership at the board level. And I don't expect anything different when the budget struck this year. And so, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that we don't have all the money that we want. But in anybody's family, you don't have all the money that you want. And so you learn to live within the budget that you have to live within. It's prudent. It's prudent. Thank you. Is there any public comment? My name is Tom Frank. I'm a resident of Crofton. Uh, I've sat here and um, 
tried to understand and listen to the discussion about the budget. Um, there's one item I'd like some understanding and clarification on, and that is the subject of school start time and whether or not there are funds in the budget for that and to what extent uh, there is an interest in our uh, school system in spending that money and in what period of time. Uh, I wonder if I could get some um, understanding for myself and the public about where that is in terms of a priority for the superintendent um, and the school board. Thank you. Mrs. Birch? Um, I'd, I'd love to answer. Um, it is a priority for us. We voted on it. We put it in our budget. We asked for money in our transportation category. Um, we can't spend the money unless it's in our transportation category. The county executive chose not to give us the money in our transportation category. So we are unable, if a budget passes the way the county executive introduced it, we are unable to do anything, including purchase transportation software or um, um, put out additional transportation contracts to support earlier school start times because there is no money to support those contracts um, because we cannot shift money from one state budget um, category to another. Um, so the county executive has chosen not to fund starting school times later in his budget. So it was our priority. We put it in our budget. The county executive chose not to put it in his budget. Um, we will have to wait and see what the county council does when they act on the budget. Mr. Saknovix, can you add anything to that? As a taxpayer, that's something that's of interest to me. Uh, will I see uh, school start times in my lifetime? We, we just asked Mr. Sheknovitz that question, what was the difference between the state categories and what we have? We don't have that answer yet. You'll have to speak to the county executive and the county council at this point because we can only ask. We can't, we can't make them give us the money. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. I think this goes directly to the point of understanding the dollars that we've got, where they are right now, and then being able to have the conversations. The county, having the conversation with the county executive at this, at this particular point is, is moot. Mm -hmm. He has spoken on the dollars that he can put where they, where they are, and we know what they are, and we're gonna get the 14 state categories. But we need to be able to articulate that very, in a very educated way to our seven county council members. We will do that and they will make the final decision associated with where the dollar we know this is this is a priority for the county council they they've they've spoken out with resolution and lots of other things and so we have to have those collaborative conversations and ensure that they understand the impact of not doing certain things they're smart gentlemen they will make the call in order whether or not we're going to be able to do it later this year is there any additional public comment on this on the operating budget? Okay, so we're now ready for the capital. Yes, ma'am, and uh, this will be very straightforward. So uh, this is the county executive's proposed uh, capital budget for the fiscal year 2016. And uh, again, just simply to orientate you to the page, uh, it's listed in the priority order that was established by the Board of Education number one through 31. Those items that are highlighted in blue indicate that they were uh, they were in fact funded, although not at the level that was initially requested uh, by the Board of Education. Those items that are highlighted in white uh, are an exact match. So, for example, the Board of Education requested a million dollars for security. Priority number two, that is a match in the county executive's proposal. And those two items that are banded in red. Uh, indicate that they did not receive uh, funding at all. So in totality for the Board of Education direct uh, projects, uh, your budget request was $462.8 million. Uh, the funding level uh, for Board of Ed pro projects contained within a county executive's budget is $151.1 uh, uh, million. There's an additional $250,000 that goes to the Department of Public Works to assist in uh, school off-site uh, sidewalk construction. The only other uh, item of note is that, uh, as you recall uh, from the state of Maryland, of that 
uh, $151.4 million in total uh, that is allocated for the benefit of the Board of Education. Uh, approximately $37.1 million of that is coming from the State of Maryland with the balance coming from local government uh, funding. And with that overview, Madam President, I'll entertain any questions you and your colleagues might have. Mrs. Ritchie. I just noticed in here for additions that we asked for six million. Yes, ma'am. And we got nothing. Yes, that that is. Uh, How will that impact us? Well, that is uh, on purpose, actually. So we had requested uh, a, uh, funding for the construction of two gymnasium uh, additions here in the county. The state of Maryland did not approve them for funding. The state of Maryland has funding okay. constraints as well. And we try our very best and work very well, quite honestly, mm -hmm. with the county government to leverage uh, the state money as much as possible. And when the state budget did not include funding for those two gymnasiums, it simply made no sense for either uh, the right. Board of Ed or the county to put county dollars. We'll, we will re-request those two gymnasiums again from the state next year, and hopefully we would receive funding from the state next year. And then at that time, um, the county would almost certainly swoop in and provide the required matching funding. And and the Cromwell, is that the same thing there? The um, design? That would be for design funding. We did not receive, uh, the state has to concur okay. uh, and give what they call LP, local planning. Uh, the state, um, the state's approvals did not contain local planning for George Cromwell. And therefore, as a result of that, uh, similarly, uh, that will be re-requested next year, and we will work with the county government. The, and again, to their credit, um, no single state dollar was left on the table. Yeah. The, the county government very meticulously ensured that they applied their dollars exactly where they needed to be to maximize every single uh, state dollar that was heading towards uh, Anne Arundel County government. Uh, right, Anne Arundel because County schools. If, if this I mean, basically, it, the state's not, the county isn't going to put, say, yes, they're going to do it if the state hasn't, isn't going to put their piece of it in because they, we can't go, start down the road of doing something and then the state come through and say, well, no, we're not going to do that. And now we, we're vested because we, we do get, everybody likes to pretend it's 50%, but it's not really 50%. Again, that's a whole word thing. But that's not that's not the county government that's and the reason i ask is because in here some places isn't there um about uh, for for studies for um crofton or a 13th high school and about old mill uh, that is not in the board of education's budget that is uh, the, the funding county's. for that is in the county government's budget and does that have to go through the same thing like for the state uh all that uh, planning money or that initial um, feasibility study uh, funding does not have to require a state approval. You simply you need state approval when you get to the point of designing and constructing a project. Anything you do prior to that does not require state approval. Okay, but don't we sort of have the nudge from the state that says we're going to look favorably on this? I mean, like for the for the George Cromwell design, we've already done the feasibility study. We've done a feasibility study for all five of those elementary schools, Manorview, High Point, George Cromwell, right. Jessup, and Arnold, and the state has agreed with the findings. With your vote and your recommendation, the state has agreed with your plans for all right. five of those schools. We just didn't have enough money. The state didn't have enough money to go through with that, but we wouldn't have put them out there if we didn't sort of, I mean, this happened because, I mean, that's what happens sometimes, and we had changes, and, and so, so what I'm asking is that we have not put forward regarding Old Mill and any, any additional high school, we haven't put that information to the state and said, you know, this is something that we're looking at at this point. The Old Mill project is in our six year plan. The state is aware of that. We okay. provided them data and information, but it is an out year. So we have to telegraph to the state what we are planning on doing. Okay. So we give the state a one year CIP and that's what's acted upon every year. That's what's before the state and the county right now. We also, uh, do tell the state what we have planned in those next five years. Old Mill is in that plan, so the state is very aware, uh, and we've had extensive discussions with them about Old Mill. Um, but uh, a, a, 
a school for a high school in the Crofton area is not contained in a board approved six year plan at the moment. And don't we have that MGT study coming out? And that's supposed to come like in August, September? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And and so the county executive's office decided to put Old Mill further, bring it in further. I mean, move it up. No, ma'am. The, the county, it's my understanding through conversations with the county government, um, Old Mill is a very complex yeah. project. And in their estimation, and there's a lot of validity to it, uh, to spend some upfront planning money okay. to uh, study not only the old mill property that we own, but possibly other properties uh, around that area that could support school construction. Uh, we have some complexities. Uh, old mill is in the uh, flight path right. of uh, FAA slash MAA, Maryland Aviation Authority. So doing some of that upfront money, uh, upfront uh, engineering work to, to find out what parts of the property can be built on? Are there any environmentally sensitive areas? Are there any specimen trees that cannot be removed? Are there any streams? Are there any flight path restrictions? So this would allow us to, at a very cursory and yet uh, smart manner, study our old mill property and other properties around the area so that when we do get to the point of doing old mill, we've already done a lot of that oh, leg, leg work and we don't have to spend in our wheels uh, going down a path that may not be viable well and i just want i want again it's again for clarity and, and to let people understand it, they didn't take these six million dollars and the two million and i don't put my glasses back on they didn't take those two monies and move them someplace else basically those were not funded by the state so therefore the county didn't put their pieces in yet and we'll go back to the drawing board for those correct the, they the county moved, that did, money wasn't moved to someplace else the county did a the county did as they do every year an excellent job in my estimation technically speaking they did an excellent job with that capital uh, improvement budget that's before you to make sure that every dollar is applied as efficiently as possible okay thank you mr. Jackson yes ma'am thank you um, I would like to just start with uh, thanking our fiduciary authority for the recommendation of 151.4 million it's not perfect uh, but it's um, it's dollars that will be well spent from a capital perspective to help our children. And so I'm very, very appreciative of um, getting uh, over $150 million for, for our kids, at least the recommendation from the county executive. Relative to the local planning piece of George Cromwell, can you just explain quickly why did the state then jump over, you know, your Jessup or your or jump over George Cromwell for your Jessup and your Arnold and, and other schools that were there. If it was just purely a money piece and we have our priorities and we transmit that forward to the state, why did they decide from a local planning standpoint not to fund it? I can't speak for the state, but uh, if you allow me to speculate, I believe it's because George Cromwell is, uh, is a school that's under capacity. Uh, the others are over capacity, so possibly that went into the calculus of the state when they're looking at prioritizing uh, certain things. But again, I would fully suspect that this Board of Ed would re-advocate for George Cromwell next year. Um, the state has spending affordability limits just like the county government does, and they try to fit the projects into their spending affordability models and ultimately um, you okay. know, not everything will fit inside of the model. So they do have, they have some sort of internal prioritization algorithm. We don't know what that is um, all the time. We don't get to see that. But I do know one of the uh, factors uh, that everyone has to consider is Cromwell's under capacity, and that might have been it. So can we maybe have a conversation with Dr. Lieber to understand if that is in fact uh, the reason why? Because I think that also obviously needs to go in our MGT study when we redo that. And we need to make sure that the folks that are doing our MGT study are thinking about those kinds of things because it's going to impact, uh, you know, our ranking and so forth of schools as we go forward. Is that fair? Uh, they're well aware of that already. So. Okay. Can we ask that question of Dr. Lieber just to be able to understand so we're not speculating? Yes, sir. 
Okay. And then for uh, priorities one, six, nine, and 10 under the capital budget, those are less than what we requested. So kind of like what we talked about with respect to our um, a board of ed request versus what we were, what the county executive has proposed. Can we understand what those priorities are of what we are going to go out, what we would go out and do with the 750 for 750 K, for example, uh, for priority one, when we requested 1 million, that means 250,000 is something we're not going to have under the proposed budget uh, from the county executive. So that 250,000, what are we not going to do? That's the level of information that will be very helpful to me as a board member when I'm having the conversations with uh, what we're not going to be able to do relative to health and safety in 2016. Is that and, and on so forth on down the list, the maintenance backlog, the asbestos abatement, the barrier free access and so forth. I understand your request. OK, thank you. Mrs. Birch. Um, first, I want to go on record <laughs> saying that I'm disappointed there's no playground money because I think that it's really atrocious that we don't play for pay for replacement playgrounds at our schools and that then there's sort of an inequity for schools that can afford to pay for playgrounds and schools that don't I think that should be our responsibility um, of course we have I forget how many millions of dollars to pay for bike paths this year but we don't have any money to pay for playgrounds at our elementary schools um, I do have a question um, what exactly is the impact of the fact that the county executive in his plan has zeroed out every in the future project except for Old Mill in his long term pro plan. All of the elementary schools, Bates, only Old Mill is funded in his out your plan. I'm just curious. I mean, is he really not ever want to fund a school? renovation again except for old mill i would never think to speak on behalf of the county executive okay. at all however i believe that there might be some alignment with comments that mr jackson made earlier in that we do have uh, an mgt study coming out that i think would provide valuable information in terms of the order in which future projects uh, would be undertaken so there may be some consideration and not committing to projects further out into the future until the data is available for both the board, the superintendent, the county council, and the county executive about those, the next 10 years worth of projects. But then the logic fails because there is money for three schools. So the, the logic of that conclusion fails when you do fund three schools and not all of the other schools. So there's the, th the schools you mentioned are schools that we've already um, that we've done feasibility studies for, I believe. So are you talking specifically? No, I'm talking about Old Mill High School oh, okay. and Old Mill Middle North okay. and I'm South. I'm sorry, I thought you were talking which, about the elementary schools. Which do schools. have <coughs> planning and construction funds in the out years, mm -hmm. and they're the only schools that do, but, you know, Tyler Heights does not, whereas I think we've all mentioned that as a, as we know it's a priority, and it does not have any funding. Um, Hillsmere <laughs> does not but old mill does. So if, if the thought was that we should wait till the MGT study, I'm just, I'm just a little unclear as to why some schools get to be in the plan and other schools don't. Um, I guess it would have been better probably to wait on all of the schools if we're waiting for the MGT study and not, not come to a conclusion on some schools and not others. Thank you. I, I also want to um, echo Mr. Jackson that I'm, I was very pleased to see this capital budget um, with the 151 million. I just had a question about Crofton and Old Mill um, feasibility studies. You said they were in the county government's budget. Um, does that mean that the county government will initiate those feasibility studies without input from this board? Are they able to do that? Well, all of that remains to be seen. Do they have the ability to do that? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Okay. They have the ability to do it, although I, I believe that they would be motivated to collaborate with the school district in that. Okay. Is there any public comment on the capital budget? All right. I think we're done with capital or operating capital budget. Thank you. The last of the review items is 5.03 award of contracts. Is there any board questions or comments? Is there any public comment? 
Okay, and the last four items are consent items 6.01 through 6.04 award of contracts. Do I have a motion to bundle these four consent items and move them from information to action? All those in favor? We now have an action item. Dr. Alato, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I uh, recommend the Board of Education award contracts as listed on today's agenda 6.01 through 6.04 inclusive. Mr. Jackson. Yes, ma'am. I just want to quickly highlight that so it doesn't get lost um, uh, within uh, these 6.1 to 6.4 is um, Georgetown East Elementary School. Um, but it's not only going to be the, the kindergarten addition, it also includes the health suite security, uh, the health suite and the security entrance and office suite. So, um, you know, it's good to see that that $3 million um, addition is going to move forward very quickly. Thank you. Before we adjourn for back into closed session, oh, I'm sorry, all those in favor. <laughs> Motion passes, five zero zero. Um, I just have three announcements. The next Board of Education meeting is Wednesday, May 20th at 7 p.m. The next Board Policy Committee meeting is Wednesday, May 13th at 8.30 a.m. And the next Board Budget Committee meeting is Wednesday, May 13th at 12.30 p.m. in Conference Room 2B. Mrs. Nally. I'd like to move that the Board of Education goes into <clears throat> closed session to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. All those in favor? We're now in closed session. Thank you. Thanks.